so I'm, uh, I am one of the faculty in the Division of Geo and Oncology. I trained here for, I did medical school here and then did my uh, fellowship at UCSF and Stanford um, and then was on faculty in the University of Utah for um, a few years before returning back to Seattle, which is my home. I'm currently uh, the section chief for G1 Oncology up at UW Medical Center Northwest, which is our second campus. Um, and uh, I do surgery uh, up here and at the main Montlake campus and as well as chemotherapy, which is centralized down to the Montlake campus. Um, but a lot of our patients come from outside of Seattle. And so a lot of the names on this conference are actually quite Quite familiar to me because we work in partnership with a lot of people who are on this call and um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here so thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I uh, uh, hope that I can impart some uh, some of these updates in G1 Oncology. We've had a really exciting uh, last year or year and a half. Um, okay let me see if I can Okay, perfect. Um, so I don't have any uh, financial or other conflicts of interest to disclose. The one thing I would say is that I have benefited greatly from listening to Katie Moore, who is uh, a brilliant G1 oncologist in Oklahoma who gives an ASCO updates talk every June at our WAGO meeting. And so a lot of the brilliant insights that she, uh, she imparted at that meeting, I will try to pass along to you guys today, um, but just wanna give appropriate credit to Katie Moore. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, it's been an incredibly exciting uh, year, year and a half in the field of G1 oncology. We've had a lot of practice changing data presented at ASCO, ESMO, and SGO. Um, we have just a brief session today, but I want to touch on kind of the highest yield takeaways from all this recent data. And like others, I've broken it down by anatomic site and ovary tends to take the lion's share of the space. We'll talk about upfront therapy. Uh, we'll talk about management of recurrent disease. And then um, I'll have time uh, at the end to touch on uh, cervix. So in upfront, uh, Paula and Prima were um, both uh, presented previously, but there were some updates presented at ASCO. Um, and in recurrent disease, uh, the final overall survival results from SOLO2 were presented, and I'll show you those. Um, uh, they presented NRG GY004, um, which is non looking at non-chemotherapy options for recurrent disease. And then the age-old controversy of the role for secondary cytoreduction uh, in ovarian cancer has been revitalized with the presentation of desktop three. Um, in cervix, the long-term oncologic outcomes of Centacol 1 and 2 uh, in early stage cervical cancer, looking at sentinel lymph node technique, uh, were presented. And then I actually thought this was an interesting trial looking at camerlizumab and apatinib in recurrent metastatic disease, which is a really difficult to treat uh, population. And then finally, in endometrial cancer, there just wasn't a ton of data <laughs> presented at um, ASCO this year. Um, probably the landmark practice changing data that's been presented recently was the LENPEM, uh, uh, pembrolizumab, and levatinib. Um, and I don't have a slide on that, but um, that's been uh, really practice changing and has kind of opened up this additional investigation into more molecularly targeted therapies in endometrial cancer, which historically I think has gotten a bit of a short shift. Um, uh, in our research venues. So um, this particular study I'll present uh, was looking at um, a WE1 inhibitor, adivocetib, um, in recurrent uterine serous carcinoma, uh, for which uh, our current options are pretty limited. So um, this is not news to you guys, but um, the recent paradigm shift in the upfront management of ovarian cancer, we've certainly entered the era in which PARP inhibitor maintenance um, is being considered for uh, the vast majority of advanced ovarian cancer patients. And as you may recall, the results of SOLO1 were presented uh, back in October 2018, and then shortly thereafter, the uh, regulatory approval uh, for elaborate maintenance after upfront chemotherapy in BRCA mutated ovarian cancers, um, which was, you know, of course, practice changing. And then now less than two years later, we have two additional uh, approvals for frontline ovarian cancer maintenance uh, with, the, with the results of PALA-1. 
which looked at a laparib plus bevacizumab uh, uh, maintenance in all comers with newly diagnosed ovarian cancers. And uh, this also led to regulatory approval, but with a specific indication for HRD positive tumors. And then finally, Prima, uh, the most recent approval, um, evaluating niraparib maintenance uh, in newly diagnosed uh, ovarian cancers, all comers again, uh, with complete or partial response to platinum-based chemotherapy, which as you know, is the vast majority of patients with ovarian cancer. Um, so both Prima and Pella were presented at ESMO last year, so about a year ago, um, uh, but have been, you know, really practice changing. So this is, um, these are the results from Prima and Paola. Uh, just for your reference, the PFS curves are shown up here. Um, Prima on the left and Paola on the right. Uh, looking at the hazard ratios, obviously in all comers, these were extremely positive studies with a hazard ratio of 0.62 for Prima and 0.6 basically for Paola 1. Um, but in both cases, as you can see on the right, the benefit was uh, much more substantial in the HRD positive population. And these results are incredible. Those hazard ratios are, are really uh, remarkable in terms of, you know, a huge reduction in the risk of progression or death. Um, at ASCO this year, they presented um, uh, this, a couple of updates to both Prima and Paula. This uh, was an exploratory analysis of the outcomes for BRCA1 versus BRCA2 in Paola1, um, which, as I mentioned, remember the indication now regulatory approval was for HRD positive tumors, which is um, either a BRCA mutated or having, it was defined as having a positive HRD assay um, uh, in addition to BRCA mutations. So um, for BRCA mutation carriers, you see the, the PFS curves on the left and on the right is for BRCA2 mutations. And actually, um, while both are still incredible, um, the, the benefit is slightly greater actually for BRCA2 mutations. Um, and so this is something we've actually seen in other data that, that for some reason BRCA2 mutation carriers do actually do a little bit better. And perhaps BRCA2 mutations is a slightly better prognostic indicator for response to PARP inhibitor therapy. But, you know, obviously you wouldn't withhold, I mean, all people with BRCA1 mutations should be getting PARP inhibitor maintenance. Um, Paola 1 um, was uh, designed with an active comparator arm, so the control arm was bevacizumab maintenance. Um, and so, you know, even the um, even the patients who didn't get PARP, actually their PFS was, was better uh, uh, than sort of a non-BRCA uh, population for sure. Uh, another, uh, I thought, interesting abstract was um, looking at the oncologic outcomes for niraparib in patients receiving either the standard dosing of niraparib, which was 300 milligrams, or the individualized starting dose uh, in Prima. So we're all aware of these dosing issues for niraparib um, because I'm sure any of us who have used it, we've seen uh, the significant thrombocytopenia caused by this drug. It's certainly more uh, prevalent than for any of the other PARP inhibitors. And after NOVA, uh, which was the recurrence trial for niraparib, they performed this post hoc analysis to try to figure out who's most at risk for this grade three thrombocytopenia um, or greater. And you know, this generated what we now refer to as the weights and plates uh, dosing parameters for, for starting niraparib. And um, I'm sure most of us have adopted that dosing guideline. But, but what hasn't been answered um, until now uh, really is whether the efficacy uh, oncologically is the same if you're starting at a lower dose. And so that's what um, uh, this uh, study was, was trying to evaluate. And so as I mentioned, the fixed starting dose is 300 milligrams daily. However, if either uh, the body weight is less than 77 kilograms or the platelets are less than, a, the starting platelets are less than 150,000, uh, then the individual starting dose or the ISD is 200 milligrams daily. And they didn't use weights and plates uh, criteria as a stratification factor in Prima, bec um, but the table uh, here shows that the groups were actually pretty much the same, with the important exception of patients uh, with a complete versus a partial response to therapy. And actually, these were, were slightly higher uh, percentage of patients coming on to study with a partial response who were in the ISD arm um, compared to the FSD arm. And so when you're looking at efficacy, obviously, it seems like it's actually a little bit weighted, if anything, against the ISD arm uh, based on who, uh, how the initial response to chemotherapy uh, ended up falling out. 
And so if you look at the hazard ratios here on the right, um, you'll note that the FSD hazard ratio was 0.59, the ISD uh, was 0.69, and the confidence intervals for these uh, completely overlap. And so, you know, I've used this in sort of talking with patients who tend to be pretty nervous about starting at a lower dose just on, just based on these, you know, not based on toxicity that's been, you know, demonstrated, but just de novo starting at the lower dose. Um, uh, you know, I've been able to reassure patients uh, that the oncologic outcomes seem to be uh, exactly the same. Um, and then looking at the hematologic toxicity outcomes, uh, the, with the ISD, the rate of grade three or greater hematologic toxicity of any kind went from 76 to 60%, uh, but the grade three thrombocytopenia or greater decreased from 48 to 21%. So a very significant reduction uh, in these severe thrombocytopenia uh, uh, complications when you started a lower dose in appropriate patients just makes this drug much safer to use. Okay, um, moving on to recurrent setting, but staying on the topic of PARP inhibitor. So um, the final results of uh, SOLO2, uh, final overall survival results of SOLO2 were presented this year at ASCO. And SOLO2 enrolled patients with BRCA mutated cancers who've responded to platinum-based chemotherapy in the recurrent setting. And then they were randomized to elaborate versus placebo until toxicity of progression. Um, PFS data were highly favorable, which led to the regulatory approval. And now the um, the OS survival, the overall survival, which was a secondary endpoint, was presented. And, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the overall survival um, uh, was improved by almost 13 months with a hazard ratio of 0.74. And keep in mind that the data, at least on this slide, is not adjusted for, for subsequent crossover. And there were a significant percentage of patients who subsequently crossed over to, uh, very appropriately, to PARP inhibitor therapy um, at a later date. And the benefit was still, uh, you know, 13 months. But you may notice, uh, those of you with a sharp eye would notice that the confidence interval actually hits one. Uh, the P value is barely not significant. Um, I don't have the slide for um, the, uh, the adjusted data for subsequent PARP inhibitor use because it's just not it's not real life. Um, but in that case, the, the OS uh, improved by 16.3 months with a very significant um, hazard ratio. And so, you know, this is a clinically significant benefit of 13 months uh, extension in the recurrent setting. And so, you know, this is definitely become standard of care. Um, it's also worth noting that all of these patients in SOLO2 were PARP naive. Um, this is before frontline PARP inhibitor therapy uh, or PARP inhibitor maintenance became standard of care. Um, and so what this means in terms of, you know, how we use PARP maintenance in the recurrent setting, I think we're all sort of learning. Uh, we don't actually have any high quality data that tells us, uh, that tells us what to do in that situation. Um, but TBD here. But this is, you know, ext uh, extremely good evidence for using uh, part maintenance in this setting. Um, I, I thought this was just worth pointing out, right? So 28% of those randomized to a laparib had not moved on to subsequent therapy at five years. 22% uh, were still on their olaparib maintenance at five years after completion of chemotherapy in the recurrent setting. And for those of you who treat recurrent ovarian cancer know that that is just, that is just mind blowing. That is that you know, we're lucky usually if we get six to 12 months after their first recurrence for their second remission. Um, and this is opposed to only 13% of patients randomized to placebo. So we're, we're giving these people so much more time off of chemotherapy, knowing full well, of course, that they're going to recur and they'll get more chemotherapy in the future. But with each, you know, we used to tell people that each subsequent remission got shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, right? Until you just were on therapy until, you know, until you elected to stop therapy. Um, this has really changed that paradigm. And for some you know, for, for these BRCA mutated cancers, um, we get prolonged remissions in the recurrent setting. Um, so, um, okay, so what about using PARP inhibitor instead of chemotherapy? Uh, they present, the data for energy GYO4 was presented at ASCO this year. Um, you know, this was a study we all enrolled patients on here at the University of Washington. We were really super hopeful that we might find uh, uh, an indication for, you know, not using chemotherapy in the recurrent setting. Um, so this study compared single agent olaparib or olaparib plus sidurinib uh, versus platinum-based doublet chemotherapy, which was investigator's choice and was not 
uh, importantly, not followed by maintenance uh, therapy. So sidirinib, right, is an oral uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor against VEGF. Um, and so the non-chemo arms were entirely oral regimens, which is highly uh, appealing to many patients, actually. Um, and obviously, you can see here the PFS curves completely overlap. Um, the median PFS is shown on the right here, right? Um, for chemo versus combo versus the lap rib, uh, the, uh, uh, the PFS was 10 versus 10 versus eight months. Um, and uh, the hazard ratio for chemo versus the combo was not significant. Uh, 0.8, so not terribly impressive. Um, so my interpretation of this data is that, you know, clearly indicates that PARP inhibitor plus sidirinib does not outperform platinum-based chemotherapy in this setting, and platinum-based doublet chemotherapy should and does actually remain the standard of care in this setting. And this definitely, this was not, um, uh, designed as a non-inferiority study, but you could look at this data <laughs> and think, hmm, I have a patient who really doesn't want chemotherapy or really can't get chemotherapy for some reason. Um, and it, it, it may be reasonable to try, um, to try this in that setting. Um, they also showed the OS data, which wasn't uh, the primary endpoint, also is not mature yet, but clearly these curves are not going to be different. Um, the one thing that is worth keeping in mind is that during the course of the study, PARP inhibitor maintenance in the recurrent setting, um, uh, not just olaparib, but rucaparib um, and niraparib, uh, all became standard of care, and they were not allowed to amend the protocol. And so the chemotherapy arm in this study actually does not reflect the current of standard of care in which platinum-based doublet chemotherapy would then be followed by PARP inhibitor maintenance. Um, and so what would have happened if maintenance PARP had been allowed after that? we could probably speculate that the outcomes would have favored the chemo arm even more uh, than is what than what is uh, pictured here. Okay, um, last bit. Uh, Last bit on ovarian cancer um, was the presentation of desktop three, which looked uh, at the role for secondary cytoreduction. And this is not the first trial. Uh, this is not the, the only recent trial to look at this. You guys may have heard about uh, GOG 213. And I'll point out some kind of important differences between this trial and 213. Um, this has been a really hot topic uh, for years and years and years. Um, always uh, vigorously debated in the clinical setting. Uh, and we've not really had any good prospective data until recently. Um, and as surgeons, we always really love the opportunity to uh, operate. But a couple of years ago with 213, uh, the option was essentially eliminated for the vast majority of patients with recurrent ovarian cancer. But then desktop three comes along and opens this can of worms all over again. Um, this is the study schema. Uh, they enrolled patients with their first platinum recurrence and a positive AGO score, um, which I'll actually come back to in a second because it's really important. And the patients were then randomized to uh, secondary cytoreduction surgery followed by platinum sensitive chemo. Uh, or no surgery with immediate initiation of platinum sensitive, sorry, platinum based chemo. And um, unlike GOG213, bevacizumab was not incorporated in the study design. Uh, this trial was done in Europe and Bev use is uh, significantly less uh, common in that setting. Um, so the AGO score, as I mentioned, is really important. To qualify uh, or to have a positive AGO score, patients had to have an ECOG performance status of zero, not one, has to be zero, and had to have a complete macroscopic resection at their primary surgery. So this is a highly selected group of patients who they're considering for additional surgery. Um, and they couldn't have any significant ascites. Um, and so as opposed to GOG213, um, in which the evaluation of resectability was really left to uh, the surgeon's discretion, and we all kind of know how that goes, um, this study was much more uh, standardized in terms of how they assessed uh, who would be a candidate for, um, who would be likely to have a subsequent successful resection. And then the other important difference is that the disease-free interval of patients uh, enrolled uh, was pretty different than 213. So in desktop three, about three quarters had uh, a progression-free interval of more than 12 months. And the median PFI actually was um, 20 months in desktop three. And in GOG 213, it was much shorter. Um, actually, the median PFI was less than, was less than 12 months um, in 213, which is really actually a, a, a legitimate criticism of, of 213. 
So for the patients um, who had surgery, things went pretty well, actually. Um, only about a third of them required a bowel resection, um, which is lower than for patients who are getting their primary site of reduction. Um, and there were really very few complications uh, or, you know, severe complications, I would say. And importantly, they were able to achieve macroscopic uh, complete resection in the recurrent setting in about 75% of patients, which is really commendable, I would say. Um, and here is the uh, overall survival curve. Um, the OS in uh, surgical patients was much better, uh, significantly better than those in non-surgical patients with a median OS of 54 versus 46 months. So you get an additional seven to eight months um, according to uh, this large prospective trial. A lot of patients would consider that worthwhile especially if they're symptomatic uh, from the recurrence. Um, so, but what happens if you just look at the patients who had surgery and then look at the survival among those who had a complete resection versus those for whom uh, uh, we couldn't get it all and they had residual disease at the end of the surgery. And these are the curves that are shown on top here. Um, and they're not so great. <laughs> if you can't get any, if you can't get it all out, right? If there's residual disease at the end of your secondary site of reduction, um, the OS uh, for complete resection being 62 months and the OS for for residual disease group being 29 months, um, so significantly shorter. And then if you compare patients who uh, had complete resection at surgery, so the, the most favorable group versus those going straight to chemo without any surgery at all, uh, those patients had an OS of 48 months. And so if you take a patient to surgery, you can't get it all out. The survival of 29 months is much shorter than if you just went straight to chemo alone. Uh, which is 48 months. And so the real question is, you know, how do we figure out who it is that we're harming by taking for this secondary cytoreduction? reduction? And even with this, you know, highly refined, um, I didn't even go in the history of how they got the AGO score, but this highly refined uh, selection criteria for taking patients to surgery, you know, uh, we probably do need to do better than that. So um, I, the jury's still out on this. I think, with with rare exception, we're still not we're still being very cautious about secondary cytoreductive surgery. I would say. Okay, I think that <laughs> ties up ovarian cancer. Uh, um, but a, a couple of things I just wanted to present from cervical and endometrial cancer. The first is the. Um, combined retrospective analysis of Sentical-1 and Sentical-2. So Sentical-1 was uh, the trial done in early stage uh, cervical cancer looking at sentinel lymph node biopsy. Patients had sentinel lymph node biopsy and full pelvic lymphadenectomy as standard of care. Um, and from this, we derived the, the sensitivity specificity um, uh, positive predictive positive predictive value and negative predictive value of the sentinel lymph node biopsy technique, which has been highly adopted in endometrial cancer and now also uh, in cervical cancer, um, but, um, and actually is the same technique uh, uh, specifically. Um, Sentinel-2 was in the follow-up study using the same uh, low-risk patient population. If they had a negative sentinel lymph node on frozen, they were randomized to just sentinel lymph node uh, or a full lymphadenectomy. And then um, this had a really excellent negative predictive value. It was reported to be 100%. And so um, in this analysis, they looked at the uh, oncologic outcomes from these cohorts um, and disease-free survival up top here was the uh, primary endpoint. And they only included patients with negative nodes. They, they excluded the patients who had positive nodes. Those were, um, uh, you know, fell out uh, with a much worse prognosis. Um, they included both squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinomas. Most were 1B1 or 1A2. Uh, most surgeries were, were minimally invasive. So this is pre-LAC trial. Um, that was the big trial that was done looking at um, minimally invasive radical hysterectomy versus open abdominal radical hysterectomy. And this really rocked our world. Uh, we have gone back entirely to open abdominal hysterectomies in cervical cancer um, as a result of that trial. Um, uh, these were small tumors. They had no LVI and 82% were said list criteria low. So, so this is a really low risk group of patients in terms of risk of recurrence. And here are the disease free and disease specific survival. So PFS and OS, and there's no difference. Um, and so this is again, really nice evidence uh, that sentinel lymph node technique is safe in cervical cancer. Um, 
does not negatively affect oncologic outcomes. And actually, Centacol 3 is the ongoing prospective study uh, looking uh, at these oncologic outcomes prospectively for sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, from a non-surgical standpoint, um, I wanted to just highlight this abstract looking at camerlizumab plus apatinib uh, in advanced cervical cancer. Um, you know, this is a difficult to treat population, patients who've recurred and have had the GOG240 regimen, uh, cysts or carbo plus paclitaxel plus bevacizumab, but who have progressed. Um, tend to have an extremely poor prognosis. And so, you know, I thought this was a compelling study. Um, it was a phase two trial uh, looking at camerlizumab, which is a monoclonal PD PD-1 antibody, of course, and a patinib, um, uh, an oral TKI. And uh, they enrolled patients with uh, histologically confirmed metastatic recurrent disease. Um, pr primary endpoint here was objective response rate. And then they did look at this exploratory translational endpoint to uh, regarding the association between PD-1 expression and efficacy. But um, so this this is the waterfall plot of how they did, and actually it's fairly impressive. The majority of patients on this regimen responded, um, and with an overall response rate of sixty percent, and you know obviously most were partial responses, um, and this is something we just don't see in this patient population. I cannot think of a regimen that has uh, been associated with this degree of response. And of course, it's small. It's a phase two uh, trial without a control arm. But um, it's uh, it was impressive nonetheless. And actually, patients stayed on for quite a while. So the median duration of response was nine months, which is actually much longer than we typically see with chemotherapy. And toxicity is really similar to what we see with uh, the LENPEM regimen that we have been using in endometrial cancer. Um, so it's not entirely benign regimen, right? That's a, that can be a tough regimen too. Um, but um, uh, it was it was manageable in most cases, certainly acceptable given the circumstances. So I actually walked away from this thinking that I'm going to try to get uh, LENPEM uh, approved in in a metastatic cervical cancer patient. See if I can. See if I can swing that. Um, okay, almost done here. So this is um, the study I'll present on endometrial cancer. Uh, there, as I said, there just was not much at ASCO this year, um, but uh, I thought this was provocative and I didn't want to leave out endometrial cancer at all. <laughs> um, uh, it happens to be my most favorite disease site to treat. Um, I'll give that disclosure. Um, so this this study looked at um, the WE1 inhibitor adivocertib uh, in patients with recurrent uterine serous carcinoma. Um, so uh, the WE1 inhibitor targets the DNA checkpoint two. So for patients with p53 mutations, you know, obviously super common across all multiple malignancies. Um, uh, or other reasons why they may have increased replication stress, like high oncogene activation. Um, blocking checkpoint two makes biological sense. Um, and so, um, you know, in this single arm study, um, this was a very heavily pretreated population. And, um, you know, amazingly, they saw a response rate of 30%. And this is just Again, not something we see very commonly in this particular population. And over here, the spider plot showing a sort of um, impressive depth and duration of response as well. Um, they weren't able to identify an obvious molecular signature for response, um, but uh, they did find that one of their kind of super responders, so to speak, um, had a two copy loss of F FBXW7, which um, uh, actually turns out to not be such a negligible percentage of patients in endometrial cancer, probably about 10 to 15% of all patients with endometrial cancer if you look at TCGA. So um, if, that is a, if that's a, a real signal, then this is something that actually could benefit um, a not insignificant proportion of our patients with this challenging disease. Um, and I think you guys have used this uh, more, than, more than I have. Um, and the toxicity seems to be uh, fairly manageable. Um, GI and hematologic stuff. So, um, so just kind of to summarize uh, on a big level, you know, PARP inhibitor maintenance is now considered standard of care, uh, at least to be uh, considered for all patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer in the upfront setting. Um, uh, when you're using niraparib, um, it's okay to uh, 
reassure patients that the uh, lower starting dose has equivalent oncologic outcomes to the higher uh, fixed starting dose and is actually much safer. Um, the uh, final OS analysis of SOLO2 in the recurrent setting uh, provides uh, a clinically significant overall survival benefit in platinum sensitive recurrent disease and an overall survival benefit in recurrence is a rare <laughs> outcome. Um, for ovarian cancer. Um, we may be reconsidering uh, secondary cytoreduction reduction in some patients. So if you have, if you're seeing a patient with, you know, what appears to be an isolated recurrence, um, it's okay to ask uh, or send them back for a consideration of a surgical intervention. Um, and it, you will be seeing uh, ongoing uh, patients who've had sentinel lymph nodes in cervical cancer, uh, but we are still evaluating that prospectively uh, for uh, definitive uh, answering for definitively answering that question. And then, you know, the role for IO plus TKI and metastatic recurrent cervical cancer, you know, I think is really exciting as are these kind of molecular, um, select, molecularly selected uh, uh, um, therapies in uh, metastatic endometrial cancer. And um, at the U, at, um, we have, in G1 Oncology, we have, we have a new uh, precision medicine uh, tumor board specifically for G1 Oncology. So if you have any patients who uh, um, you feel would be reasonable or would you would be curious in having them um, presented, just please let me know. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Oncoplex platform that we're using at the University of Washington. Obviously, those of you here um, know about that, but um, it's a nice comprehensive assay um, and we have great partnership with the uh, molecular pathology folks who um, uh, help us interpret those results. Um, and uh, that's what I have. So hopefully it wasn't too much of a whirlwind. And of course, I'm happy to take questions.